Hello everyone. Hope you guys had a good New Year break. It's great to see you guys once again on our regular Zoom sharing session. Okay, as usual, if any one of you can't hear me clearly, uh, you can type in the chat box and, and let me know, okay? Let me check. Uh, yep, so if any one of you can't hear me clearly, do let us know in the chat box. Okay, before I begin, uh, and while we wait for more people to join us on Zoom tonight, let me just flash the usual disclaimer over here first. So anything that we share tonight is not financial advice. It is not a financial recommendation. Okay, all these are my personal opinion, and this is for educational purposes. Before you make any investment, please always do your own due diligence. Okay? Okay, so before we begin, let's do a poll first. Okay, let me launch the poll. Okay, so can you let me know how are you guys feeling about the stock markets right now? Okay, mainly the, the US markets, um, the Singapore markets, the China markets. How are you feeling about the markets now? Let me know about your sentiments through the poll that have just launched. Are you feeling more bullish or you're feeling more bearish? Okay, any more of you who wants to participate? Okay, from what I see, 71% of you guys are feeling bullish about the US markets right now. Um, oh, okay, um, about similar percentage. Okay, it has dropped to about 63% of you guys are uh, bullish about the China market and for Singapore market, 60 plus percent as well, uh, whereas 30 plus percent of you are feeling bearish about the Singapore stock market. Okay, I shall end this poll. All right, so the agenda for me today is to actually do, um, to first do a quick look at where we are right now for the US stock market. So uh, what's going to happen is I'll first start off with looking at the stock chart analysis. So I'll go through with you some of the stock chart analysis um, and also refresh a little bit of what we actually went through during the last sharing, which was uh, back in December last year, right? January, I didn't do any sharing. Um, and then we'll move on to understanding uh, more on the fundamentals okay, of the overall markets. Thereafter, I'll also be looking at China. I'll share with you more about China and Singapore markets with a quick look at uh, the financials of Alibaba and also Fraser's uh, Centerpoint Trust. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us today, tonight for the first time, uh, this is our usual monthly Zoom sharing session uh, where we'll talk about the markets, do a quick update on what has been happening recently. So for such sessions, usually I'll try and keep it short um, between 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, I'll try to, if I exceed the time, I'll also try to keep it within uh, an hour, right? So do join us on time um, because it is, a, it is a short session. So um, we wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be dragging things uh, for too long for such sessions. Uh. So if you're able to, do join us on time so that you won't miss out on anything. Okay, before I begin, um, allow me to very quickly share with you guys what are the upcoming workshops that we will be holding this month in the month of February. So the first upcoming workshop is on technical analysis 101, where you can learn about how you actually how to actually study the stock charts. Okay, how do you analyze it so that you can identify certain appropriate price levels when you want to buy or when you want to sell. So instead of just randomly buying it and selling it at any random price level uh, based on your mood right, or your emotions, how can you actually identify certain appropriate price levels where you can maximize your profits in the stock markets itself? Okay. The second workshop is on how to build passive income with uh, Singapore REITs. So we'll be covering on um, how do you actually go about picking the REITs, the Singapore REITs to, to invest in? How do you cherry pick the Singapore REITs? Um, and as well as uh, how do you actually buy that at reasonable price points? Okay, so if you're interested, you can actually scan the QR code over here or just simply type in this bit.ly um, address over here, right? bit.ly slash TGI workshops. Okay, so in our last Zoom session, um, I talked about 
the S and P five hundred. For those of you who were here during the last Zoom session, so I talked about the S and P five hundred and how uh, we actually have this resistant trend line over here. Okay. Um. So I also share with you how do we how did we actually identify this resistance trend line? It was by. It was by hold on. Uh, okay. It was by actually connecting the dots. Okay. At at the peaks. Over here. And we connect these three peaks and you extend this line. So this was how we actually identify the resistance trend line um, that I shared with you guys earlier uh, on during the last session. Now, so let's do a recap, okay? And also for the benefit of those who weren't present during the last session. Um, so back in December, when we were somewhere around here, I shared with you guys that when, when we are at this region, Okay, that is what, what we call the, the prices actually hitting a resistance zone, a resistance area. So um, at that point in time, if let's say I was thinking of investing in the SPY ETF to have exposure in the S&P 500, at that point in time, I, I wasn't going to buy, okay, at that price level over here. And the reason that I shared with you guys were because we have this very strong resistance trend line. So, um, which means to say when we are at this price point, the, the, the area which is highlighted in red, um, what could happen is there are two possible scenarios. One scenario is that it could, it could turn out to be a strong resistance, right? Where prices get resisted and it comes back down, okay? It hits here and then it comes back down, okay? And the second situation, second potential uh, scenario is that this could be a new turning point where prices actually break out of it and start to go up on an uptrend. But which scenario is going to play out, nobody can tell for sure. Now, I, I can't tell that for sure because I don't have a crystal ball, okay? So what I shared during that session is based on technical analysis, at that point in time, it may not be an opportune, op opportune time to actually buy and enter the SPY ETF if you are looking to invest in the SPY ETF, right? Uh, because if resistance, if this resistance trend line still hold, I never like to buy at resistance level because for those of you who understand the concept of resistance, it means to say there is a higher probability, a higher chance that prices will actually be chased down from that level, okay? So this was what I shared with you guys on how we can actually make use of some stock chart analysis to make more sense of uh, the stock prices and how you can actually make more informed decision um, by buying and selling at more appropriate levels. Okay, so let's look at what has happened since then, right? So what has happened since then is, Oops, okay. Let me see. Okay, so what has happened since then is that um, prices actually did indeed come down after it, it hit that resistance um, area during December 2022, after which it actually went back up again. Okay, so this time around, what we are seeing is it's a little bit different from what we had during December, okay? Why? It's because prices don't just actually hit the resistance and then come back down. Instead, it managed to break above that resistance trend line. Can you see this red color region that I have highlighted over here? So the S&P 500 actually break above that resistance trend line and it managed to stay there above that trend line for some time already, okay? And what we see is also that prices have been making higher highs and higher lows. Okay, let me try and draw this out. Huh? Uh, let me change the color. Okay, so you can see higher highs and higher low. Can you see this high over here? Is And this high over here and this new one. Okay, each high is actually higher and each low is also becoming higher, right? So that may actually mark the start of a change in trend if this actually continues up like this. Okay, so technically, we usually, how do we actually define the start of a new bull run? Now, the start of a new bull run is technically defined uh, when the stock prices rises at least 20%, at least 20% above the bottom of the bear market. Now, so this was the bottom. Um, this was the bottom over here. That was back in October 2022. Now, so uh, technically, if prices are able to stay above this level, $418, um, 
that is where we can actually, you know, declare officially that we are right in the start of a new bull run. Okay, uh, right now we have not been able to actually stay above that, only slightly hit that region, all right, um, but not, not yet there, okay? So technically, that's how we actually define the start of a new bull run. Now, so the question that you guys might have right now uh, on your mind is, so if today I'm looking to actually um, buy the SPY ETF, then what should I do right now at this moment in time? Okay, so if today I'm looking to buy SPY ETF, uh, uh, what I would do is, uh, I, I'm not going to buy at the current level right now because prices have, have actually moved up and are overextended at the moment. Okay, um, the next possible support levels based on technical analysis would be um, at somewhere around 400 and somewhere around 390. Okay, so how I get this levels is because I applied the Fibonacci retracement tool, which I have also shared before a couple of times in my previous uh, Zoom sharing sessions, all right? Um, today, I'm not going to go into the details, okay? But um, just let you see over here, okay? So the 402 and um, 390 levels, okay? So prices, what this means is that when prices retrace from where it is currently, um, there is a chance that it may hit here, and rebound back up. Or if the retracement is even deeper, then there is a chance that it may hit here and move back up based on the Fibonacci retracement tool. Now, there's, there's a reason behind it, but I'm not going to actually go, go further into it. Um, and on top of that, um, if you notice, 390 level, this level, right, it is also the previous um, support level back in, this was September and this was um, May last year okay so which means to say this is actually a rather strong level as well to look at so if today i'm looking to buy the spy etf um that's what i would do i would like to buy them at um the next support levels now of course uh we cannot catch that at that bottom right we can never catch that at that bottom that's why i actually tell you now if let's say prices retrace to a certain level and i buy prices still come down more and i still have cash i, I will still be able to enter and buy more right so in fact, if we look at Dow Jones, okay, let me see. Now, if we look at Dow Jones, we can see that actually Dow Jones rebounded faster than the S&P 500. Uh, so a lot of times we put a lot of focus on S&P 500, but if we actually look at Dow Jones um, back in last year, okay, last year, sometime in November, um, December period, this resistance trend line for Dow Jones was already broken, okay, back in November, 2022. So Dow Jones actually rebounded faster than um, the S&P 500. Now that said, um, it doesn't mean that it will go up immediately. Lah. Sometimes prices may actually um, consolidate a little bit before it moves back up um, during a recovery from, from, uh, from the bear market. So actually, that's, that's a pretty bullish signal that we have of the US stock market where we see that um, the various indices are actually starting to recover, some faster than, than others. Huh? And if we look at the VIX index, not sure if you guys still remember about this. Okay, I've shared this uh, a number of times in uh, Zoom sessions as well as on uh, my YouTube videos as well. Okay, so the VIX index, which I talked about before, uh, if you have been monitoring it, you will see that actually the prices have been, the index has been staying in the lower range of the 20s and even below 20s uh, for a couple of months already. All right. Um, and in fact, it has been making lower lows like, over here in the past few months. So that's actually a pretty good sign for the S&P 500. Now, for those of you who today first time hear about the VIX index, uh, um, the VIX index, it measures the 30-day expected volatility of the US stock market. So in layman's term, we usually use this VIX index as a gauge of the market sentiments, the general market sentiments, as well as the level of fear among uh, the overall market participants. That, that's what the VIX index is used for. And because of that, the VIX index, it has a inverse correlation with the S&P 500. So when VIX index shoots up, it means S&P 500 will crash, okay? Um, the opposite is true as well, okay? But what we noticed during the bull times, during the bull markets, is that the VIX index usually they will be staying at a very low level, um, somewhere below the 20 level mark. 
right? So, uh, which is why last time I shared before, if VIX can actually stay um, below the 20 level for a sustained period of time, that will be an even stronger indication that the market is on the recovery already, all right? Okay, so as I speak to various investors uh, now and then that I'm that I meet, um, the general consensus that I get at this moment in time is that um, most of them, they are actually afraid of, of uh, being invested in the US stock markets right now because um, they, they, they fear that the markets may crash further, that we may form another new bottom okay, for, the, for the US stock markets because of the high interest rates, because of um, a possible recession that may happen this year in 2023 or even next year in 2024, right? So we're going to understand this. We can't always catch the bottom, right? We can't always catch the exact bottom, okay? Um, today, even if we put inflation, even if we put uh, the topic of recession out of the picture, anything can happen in the markets anytime. Just like who would have predicted that we would have the Russia-Ukraine war? Who would have predicted that we would have COVID-19? Right, all the recent um airship airship event, right, the balloon balloon incident between the US and China, okay, which thankfully didn't es escalate further. Lah. But who would have predicted that such events would happen? We can't predict that. That and that is why we can't always catch the exact bottom. Okay. Um, because there are certain things that are out of our control. But as and when they come, we have to embrace them. The good news that we have is that the US market indices and the stock prices of strong businesses, they have proven to always rally over the long term. That means they have proven to always go up over the long term. So long as the businesses are still making money, they are still generating organic cash inflow. All right. They have been proven to always go up. That's the good news for us. And that's why um, we always say, you know, one way to go about doing this is. You don't throw all your money in at one go. Now, what you can do is you can split them up and buy in stages so that you can lower your average cost. So, so what happens is that you apply technical analysis. You can identify a good entry point right now. But in the event prices go down further to the next support level, you still have some money. You still have some bullets that you can put into the markets to buy at the next lower price. So that overall, that will help to reduce your average cost of your stock positions, right? So, so that's a way that we do to circumvent the fact that we can't always catch the exact bottom. Now, and if, you, if you're waiting for that exact bottom to, before you buy, uh, and in the event you never catch it, right? Then you will have to buy, end up buying at higher prices already, okay? So what we do is we don't just wait for that exact bottom. Instead of doing that, Right when prices falls to good levels, appropriate levels, um, based on the stock chart analysis, we will start buying already. Okay, and um, as pri if prices come down even more during a during a bear market, that's where we will add in at different stages so that we can lower our average cost overall. So what we are doing here is we try our best to buy at at better prices, like We try our best to lower our average cost. Um, when the opportunity arises, but we acknowledge the fact that we can't always catch the exact bottom. Okay, and even as analysts, you know, analysts have been throwing out their forecasts about uh, the prediction of the probability of a recession this year. Even as all the analysts are throwing out all these predictions um, for a recession, it is really still anyone's guess as to whether a recession will eventually happen this year, right? It's really anyone's guess. It may happen, it may not happen. Now, why do I say that? Because if we look at the situation right now, we can form both the bullish and the bearish sides of the story. Okay, let me show you. Now, so on the bearish side, we have talked about this before. Uh, we talked about the yield curve inversion in um, some of the previous webinars before. Um, and I explained to you what it means, right? And how it, it has been a rather accurate forecast um, for the past few recessions. So that is one point under the bearish argument. Um, and secondly, if we look at the forecasted um, earnings per share for the Q1 and Q2 of 2023, there is actually a forecasted decline. Now, it's a little bit small, okay, but the highlighted region is actually uh, a negative number, right? So there's a forecasted decline in EPS for the first two quarters of the year, 
right? Um, and we know that in the past recessions, right, usually what we will see is there'll be a contraction of the, the earnings per share for S&P 500. Uh. So um, that's another second argument for the bearish side. Now, but if we try and look at the bullish side, do we have anything? Yes, we actually do. Now, uh, for the bullish side, the overall earnings per share for 2023 is still forecasted to grow, although they forecast that in the first two quarter it will drop. But overall, okay, it is still overall for the entire year, it is forecasted to still grow. Okay, this blue color over here. Now, uh, which is actually rather different uh, from what we have seen in the previous recessions. Because what happened during uh 2020, 2008, um, and uh the 2000 recession, if you see over here, there was an earnings contraction, okay. It actually deep down over here, and this one also deep down over here, there was actually an earnings contraction in previous recessions. But if this is what's going to happen based on the forecast, then it seems like hmm, perhaps this is actually a bullish case. There might not be a recession this year. Okay. Um, and the second argument under the bullish side is that the non-farm payrolls increased by 517k. Okay, they expected it to be 187k, but it was so strong, it increased by 570k. And for unemployment rate, it fell to 3.4%, which is the lowest, okay, 53 year low, the lowest since 1969, right? 53 year low, 19 since, uh, since 1969. Uh, so though unemployment rate, it is a lagging indicator. Yes, it is a lagging indicator as, as to, as to, um, a signal for a recession, um, but the current exceptionally low rate seems to suggest that in the very, very near term, recession may still be out of the picture. Uh, so these are the bullish argument. And, and to add on to this bullish argument is um, the stock chart analysis that I have actually gone through with you guys earlier on, uh, where we see that the stock prices are now exhibiting uh, some recovery, as I've shared with you guys. Okay, they are turning into an uptrend, uh, breaking above the the very strong resistance trend line for the first time since the start of this bear market. All right. So, so these are some of the arguments under the bullish camp. All right. So I presented to you both the bullish and the bearish side of the argument. Now, do you think a recession is going to happen this year? I can tell you, I don't know <laughs> because it is anyone's guess whether it's going to happen or not because we have both sides of the argument. All right. Um, but the good thing is we don't actually need to actually predict whether a recession is going to happen. Okay, um, so if a recession does indeed happen and uh, if the stock market crashes more, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Now, it really depends on what you see. Okay, um, that, that nothing is as good or as bad as it seems, right? It is how you actually look at the, look at the event, look at the situation. Now, um, in the event of the bear market, continues on to deepen further, right? In the event that the, the stock market crashes down even more, it is good as well to us in a way because we can actually continue to buy the good stocks at very good prices. On the other hand, if the market continues to rally up, it is also good for us because the positions that we have are going to grow in, in, in value right, and in size. All right. So it is really how you look at the situation. Uh, there, there is, there's no good or bad. Right? It is how we look, how we frame our mindset and our thinking. And the good thing that I've shared with you guys is that Eventually, all these are just bleeps over the long term because over the long term, the US stock market always rally out over the long run. And if you are investing in very good businesses, strong businesses, over the long term, their stock prices are also going to go up over the long term. All right, and I also like to share with you guys this quote uh, from John Templeton, which is who is a legendary contrarian investor. Now, he, he once said this he said that boom markets they are born on pessimism. And they go on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. And this quote, in my opinion, it, it speaks the best of what has happened or what we have experienced so far um, in the last three years since the COVID crash. Now, let me show you why. Okay, if you look over here, this is a behavior-based index that is created by uh, TD Ameritrade to track the sentiments of retail investors. Okay, so what we have over here, the gray color line, it represents the S&P 500, okay, SPX. And the green color line, it represents this behavior-based index that they actually developed. 
So um, back in April 2020, when the stock market was starting to recover from the COVID crash, what we see is that sentiments were actually still very low, right? But as the stock prices continue to go up higher and higher, the higher it goes, the higher the confidence of the retail investors, all right? So what this means is bull markets grow on skepticism. Initially, everyone was very skeptical. Many investors were skeptical. They are, they are not sure that this is the start of a, of a, of a new bull run, right? But as the stock prices, as the, as the market continues to go up further, their confidence also go up. So this exhibits this, the quote, that bull markets grow on skepticism. Now, and what happens is, at the peak of the S&P 500, it matures on optimism. Okay, when everyone was very optimistic, that's actually the peak. And the stock market is actually going to crash down. Right? So what happens after this? Bull markets die on euphoria. As the S&P 500 crashes down, the retail investor sentiments tumble as well. So I've actually shared this um, in uh, my Telegram group chat as well. So for some of you who are in the Telegram channel, you, have see, you should have seen this, this chart over here. So what this chart tells us is that in the first few months of 2022, uh, retail investors, they were actually still uh, buying stocks. So the, the retail net flow was still positive in the first few months. So when the stock market was actually coming down at the start of 2022, in the first few months, uh, many of them believed that it was just a small correction. Okay, so many of that, many of the investors were still buying. But what happens is as the stock market crash deepened, as stock prices, as the S and P five hundred crashes down even more, the retail investors started to sell. They started to sell stock. All right, um, and the tech sector, the tech sector was uh, the one that saw the largest. Uh, net outflow of the retail fund. Okay, so this is a, a, a exhibition of how our investors' emotions are actually moved to the stock market, and how our our action, our investing decisions, also move with our emotions and the stock market prices. Now, but remember, for this quote, there's another part. It says that bull markets are born on pessimism. What does this mean? Now, if the October bottom right was really that bottom of this crash right now um what it means is that when everyone is very pessimistic when we are at the peak pessimism that is where the stock markets will start recovering now even if the october bottom is not the exact bottom even if we still have another bottom that's coming later on uh, at some point in time uh, eventually the u.s stock market will still recover right upon peak pessimism that's what it means bull markets are born of pessimism Okay, so that's what I want to share for um, the US stock market. Okay, moving on, let's look at China right now. So what happened for China? China's GDP grew by 3% for 2022. Um, though this is actually the slowest pace since the 1970s, uh, but um, China's economy still proved to be more resilient than what the analysts actually forecast. Uh. They forecasted about 2.8, 2.7, 2 2.8 GDP growth. So in December last year, China held their Central uh, Economic Work Conference, CWC, in December last year. Um, so this is where they actually the committee spoke about the, the direction and also to set the tone for China in the upcoming year. So what did they say during this CWC? Now, um, they communicated that the top priority for China right now is to ensure economic stability and also to pursue steady economic progress. That's the top priority. So gone are the days where we will see high uh, economic growth for China. Okay, Right now, China is more focused on the quality over the quantity itself. And to deliver that, what they intend to do is they want to expand on the domestic consumption through uh, income packages for their residents, through government incentives and so on. And uh, they also want to attract foreign investment and capital and to stabilize their real estate industry to reduce the financial risk of the real estate companies. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, in China, owning a property is seen as a source of economic stability. Um, it's like uh, economic security, right? Uh, and traditionally, there's this cultural belief that 
owning a home is a prerequisite for marriage. It is to make the young man more marketable in, in, the, in the marriage market. So, which is why young men as, as well as their families, they will do all they can to buy property so that it can make them uh, make the young men more marketable in the in the market. So um, some of these Chinese are also using property as an, as an investment vehicle. Now the property developers, they saw the high demand. Okay, they took on more debt for funding. What they also did is they pre-sold homes where buyers have to pay large down payments for properties that are not yet built. And they will then use that cash to go and fund to construct homes for new customers, right? So this problem has been around for very long, right? And the Chinese government sees this as an existential risk to the economy. And right now, they are, or rather since last year, they have been taking steps to defuse the risk in the property sector. Now, but we got to recognize that this real estate bubble, uh, it is not one where it can be um, resolved immediately uh, in the short term. It, it would take some years before it can clean up. And uh, it could also mean that we have slower economic growth for China in the short term. But nonetheless, the intervention from the Chinese government, um, it would more likely, it would likely to be more good than bad for China over the long term, uh, even if it means slower economic growth in the short term right now. So that's why they're also changing their tone, their focus. They're not looking at quantity now, but they're looking at the quality of the, of the growth, of the economic growth. And perhaps something which many investors are very focused on uh, is this thing on tech sector. Okay, uh, I'm sure you guys all know about the past regulations, uh, the crackdown, China, uh, China crackdown on the tech sector. Um, and back then, when this happened during the tech um, crackdown, this was a slide that we actually shared during one of our Zoom sessions back then in 2000, uh, 2021. Um, at that time, we shared that we believe that the goal of the CCP is not to destroy all these private sectors because they're actually very important to the China's economy. Um, they're important uh, in which they can help China to actually secure its position as a, as a global economic powerhouse. Okay, And if you notice what's happening right now uh, for in China is that the Chinese government seems to be changing their focus already for these tech companies. So back in 2020, CWC, at that time, the Chinese government's focus was to prevent this orderly expansion of capital for the tech companies. But what about right now? Okay. Right now, in the recent CWC, what they talk about is they highlighted the role of these platform companies, which are the tech companies, in cultivating talent, in creating jobs, and also to lead the economic growth. So this is a drastic difference um, in terms of their focus. Uh, right now versus what we had back then, two years back in 2020, where the government's focus at that time was to prevent the disorderly expansion um, of those tech companies. Now, but bear in mind that having said that, it doesn't mean to say that the tech companies are going to go back uh, to their good old days, uh, that they're going to return to their previous years of uh, you know, disorderly expansion before the regulation happened. Okay. Um, the regulations are in place, right? The fair competition practices are, that the government puts in, they are, they are going to stay. And these tech companies, they have to abide by it. Now, but if you ask me, I think that's actually pretty fair. Lah, because previously, many of these tech giants, they had uh, put on very unfair practices. Like, for example, Alibaba, they will force um, the merchant, their merchants to only list products on Alibaba platforms. They cannot list on the competitors' platforms. Right. Uh, Meituan also uses similar tactics to, to curb their rivals. Okay. So, which was actually pretty unfair. All right. So that's a broad overview of what's happening in China. Um, let's also take a look at the individual businesses right now. Um, and how they have actually fed so far, how they have been impacted so far. Okay. So for today's sharing, I've actually selected Alibaba. So let's take a very quick look at Alibaba and its financials. Huh? So Alibaba remains as the dominant player in the e-commerce markets in China. Now, um, how big is Alibaba? If you want to have an understanding of how big it is, okay, the uh, GMV of Alibaba in, in 2022, it was estimated to be about 1.5 trillion, all right? Um, and if we compare against Amazon, which we are all very familiar with, where Amazon's GMV was about 800 billion, 
And back home, we have Shopee, right? Shopee's GMV is about 70 billion. So that's how big Alibaba is, right? And these are the different various uh, revenue streams of Alibaba. Okay, it can be broken down into China commerce, international commerce. They have their local consumer services, uh, digital media, innovation, logistics as well, and also um, the cloud. And out of all these different segments, okay, the China commerce, this one, um, it contributes about 70% of their total revenue for Alibaba that they generated in, two, uh, in last year, 2022. Okay, so it's also their most profitable segment for Alibaba. So let's take a look at the profitability of Alibaba and how it has been impacted so far after the regulations, after the crackdown. So if we take a look first at the top line revenue, revenue actually has been going over the years. Now, it, it may be a little bit small, but it has been growing over the years um, by 240% over the last five years and 2,300% uh, over, over the last 10 years. Okay, but what we notice is that actually in the past, the revenue growth managed to always stay above, at least above 30% every year, year on year. But last year for FY 2022, um, the percentage growth was only 18.9%. Okay, it was only 18.9%. Uh, so what are some of the reasons causing this slowdown in, in the revenue growth? Uh, there are a number of reasons. One, it could be due to the regulatory crackdown. Okay, um, and secondly, because of the slower economic growth for China. And the third reason is, of course, we are all very familiar with the lockdown that China actually had uh, back in March 2022. So March 2022 was also the last month for the financial year FY22 uh, for Alibaba. So it coincided with that last reporting month. Um, but if you ask me whether this 19% is actually very lousy, I would say it, it is not fantastic, but it is still pretty decent growth, uh, considering that Alibaba was under the tech crackdown. Okay. And if we move on to gross profitability, if you look at gross profitability, it has been growing consistently over the years. Gross profits have been increasing. Um, but somehow, as you scan down all the way, uh, look at the net profits, how come there is a huge decline in net profits for FY 20, 2022? So now when we see this, then the question is, how come? Uh, how come gross profits increase consistently, but net profits decline by so much? So that's when where you can actually zoom in further. Uh. And if we zoom in further to analyze the financials, we can see that there are actually two main contributors, two main uh, reasons. The first one is selling and marketing expenses. It has actually uh, increased by more. Okay, it is for FY 2022, it's about 14% of the revenue. Last time it used to stay about 10, 10 to 11%. So what's happening for Alibaba is that they have they, they are still continuing to invest in all the marketing and promotion uh, to entice, to improve their deals, to entice their user base so that they can retain their current user base and also to attract new users to come on board because they still want to continue to grow, right? So you need to have new users coming in. Now, so the question as always is, is this an issue? Is this an area of concern? Um, so in my view, I think, this is not really a very big concern because um, it is a phase which many of the e-commerce businesses, they have to go through, right? They have to expand their user base. Now, and especially at that point in time, China was actually embarking on the tech crackdown. So it was a period whereby the top priority for Alibaba is to, to retain their current user base, right? Retaining and growing their current user base is something that's very important at that point in time when they had all the uh, fair play practices that were being implemented by the Chinese government. So in my opinion, this is, this is not something that is a, of a very big concern. And secondly, the second key contributor for this decline in net profits is this negative interest expense. It's actually an interest investment income now. Okay, so if you zoom over here, um, in 2021, it was a positive number. In fact, for most of the years, it was a positive number. But for last year, it was a negative number. So that means instead of adding to the net profits, uh, this, this line item actually reduces the net profits for FY 2022. Okay, which also resulted, which is also one of the bigger reasons uh, why net profits actually dropped. So some of you may be confused. Hey, why, why is this interest? interest and investment income or expense thing. Now, what it means is it actually represents the net gain, okay, or the net loss on Alibaba's investment. 
Okay, so what? So how we interpret the figure is in FY twenty twenty one there was a gain which was recorded, but in FY twenty twenty two a loss was recorded. Okay, so what happened last year, or rather, in fact, um, twenty twenty one also. Okay, what happened was that um the stock market was crashing, right? China um stocks were coming down, so the the market prices of the public listed companies they were they were declining, they were falling. So, which means to say, Alibaba actually had to record this mark to market losses on the equity investments that they have, that they invested in. All right. So, um, again, the question is, is this an area of concern? Now, no, I, I think this is just temporary, right? Because this is, ba this is because the, the market, this was due to the market decline. But eventually, once the market recovers and once the prices go back up, it will become a positive figure in the future years to come, right? So this is something that is temporary, okay? It is not the core business of the of Alibaba, right? It is not that um, this is due to the core profitability dropping, okay? Because the core business is actually still making money. So therefore, overall, based on what we have seen so far, um, my view is that despite all this regulatory crackdown, Alibaba's business it still seems to be rather resilient, um, but of course, moving forward, we're going to continue to observe how Alibaba is going to overcome the slowdown in growth um, due to all this regulatory crackdown and whether their expenditure and all the marketing, selling and marketing expenses will actually turn out um, to deliver value, to deliver return. Okay, and also other segments like cloud, cloud computing, right? The cloud segment, how can it actually create new growth opportunities for Alibaba? Now, but that said, um, in the coming FY 2023, right, that's, that's going to be reported, um, we may not see you know, very good rosy results for Alibaba. Why? Because of the lockdown that we had in China. Right? The lockdown, the extended period of lockdown that we had in China, it, it impacted at least two to three quarters of Alibaba's business for FY 2023. Okay? Because their, their market, um, their financial year end is March. All right, March. March year end. So that means it's from April 2022 to um, March 2023. Okay. So that COVID lockdown would have some impact, but nonetheless, it is temporary, right? And eventually it would pass as the China, as China now opens, reopens its economy. In fact, if I look at this report, right, it says that China, China's population, okay, about 80% of the population have already been infected with COVID. Right. So this high infection rate would provide greater immunity for the population going forward as well. Okay. So this is for China. Right. And the last one that I want to share with you guys is on Singapore. Now, Singapore REITs. This is the last segment for tonight's sharing. Um, so what happened for Singapore REITs was that 2000, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2022. Okay. Oh, tongue twister. Okay. It was a year where most of the S REITs delivered negative stock returns, all right? If you see over here, most of them delivered negative stock returns. Uh, of course, except for hospitality, which is about break even, okay, because of the reopening of the economy. Um, and over the past two weeks uh, or so, we also had most of the S REITs releasing their earnings, okay? Uh, it was the earnings season, and we had a great share of results. Last month, I also attended um, the AGM of Fraser Center Point, okay? Um, for their full year results for FY 2022. Now, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Fraser Center Point Trust, it is one of the largest sub suburban retail mall owners in Singapore with assets under management of approximately 6.2 billion, right? And it serves a combined 2.6 million catchment population, which is actually roughly about uh, half of Singapore's population. Now. Okay, so if you stay in the north, Stay in the northeast as well as the east area. Chances are you have been to one of their shopping malls already. Okay. So what happened for FCT? How's their financial? Despite the current uh, economic environment, the revenue actually still managed to increase by 4.6%. And their not net property income was also up by 4.9%. Okay, the occupancy rate also remained high at 97.5%. So in fact, in line with this reopening of the economy and living with the with COVID, uh, chopper traffic increased by 
year on year for for 2022. And as for the tenant sales, it increased by 11.3%. And in fact, if you look over here, this blue color one is 2022. It has already, tenant sale has already surpassed the pre-COVID average level already. It's really higher than the pre-COVID levels. Now, but as the world is always changing and ever evolving, right, with all the new structural changes, a business has to keep up with, with the new trends in order to stay relevant in the industry. So during the AGM, one question that was raised by the unit holders was how, how is FCT positioned on the rise of uh, e-commerce platforms? So part of FCT's effort was to actually encourage the tenants to go omni-channel, right? For some of you, we are not familiar with this, right? Because what happens is some of the tenants that have already gone omni-channel, they actually saw an increase in sales, right? So in other words, it's actually good for the tenant sales. It is helping them to grow their tenant sales. So right now, uh, part of FCT's effort is to encourage more tenants to go on each channel. Okay. And um, on, on, on the other hand, we also have all the online retailers, like for example, Love Bonito, right? They stretch their footprints beyond just the town areas. Last time, if you want to buy something from Love Bonito, I can only go to the town area. But right now, they have also set up their brick and mortar stores in the heartland malls as well. This is to cater to the changing needs of the shoppers, okay? Because partly also because right now a lot of people are working from home, so they, they will visit all the malls that are near where they stay, near their homes, okay? And um, not just that, FCT also continues to curate and refresh their retail offerings and, and they bring new brands that meet such needs. Okay, so this was something which, uh, a question which was being brought up by one of the unit holders at, at the AGM itself. As for the impact on, of the rising interest rates, um, in the recent Q1 FY23 business update, um, what we saw was that there is actually a slight weakening of the debt profile for, for FCT. Okay? Uh, if you look over here, the average cost of debt for the quarter uh, increased from 3% to 3.5%. So there is some slight weakening of the debt profile in light of this rising interest rates. And this brings me to the point that there is no one business that can be invincible and totally unaffected by all these changes in the economic environment. All right. um, but oftentimes what we notice is that the resilient businesses, they either, number one, tend to be slightly less impacted because the management is able to react quickly with a plan or number two, the business actually accumulated sufficient resources, um, meaning their cash flows, their earnings over the years of operations to, for them to go through this downturn. Now, because what's going to happen is that eventually all these economic headwinds, they will pass, right? What we are facing right now, it, eventually it will pass because the economy moves in a cycle, all right? And um, that's why we often bring across the message to our community that um, while macroeconomics does impact the earnings of, of businesses in the short term, even the good businesses, um, but they're not the most important focus because eventually they will pass, right? Uh, but what's more important is whether the business itself is fundamentally strong so that it can still continue to stay relevant, it can still continue to stay resilient over the longer term. That's what's more important, right? And all, all these are actually timeless investing principles that, that will hold in, in time to come. So for those of you who wish to actually learn how to pick Singapore REITs for yourself, to invest in and also to build your own portfolio of Singapore REITs. Um, we have an upcoming webinar, uh, sorry, upcoming workshop, okay? It's a physical face-to-face -face live workshop itself um, that we are holding on 25th February as a Saturday uh, afternoon. Okay, so what we're going to go through is how you can actually cherry pick the Singapore REITs to invest in. How do you buy them at reasonable price points? Because you must understand that many of these REITs are they go through very huge cyclical movements. So you don't want to be buying them at very high prices, then end up you go through some drawdowns and you panic and you go and sell them away, right? Um, so we'll teach you how to actually look at the charts as well for s reads as well as other key considerations when it comes to execution. So if you're interested to find out more details, you can also scan this QR code over here or you can go to this Bitly website directly, right? The second workshop that we are also holding in this month of February is Technical Analysis 101, where we will teach you the basics of TA, right? How it actually works, 
And how come you actually does work over time? Uh, and how you can actually incorporate it in your investing journey? So very importantly, we will go through with you some of the useful technical indicators that you can use to identify appropriate stock price levels to buy and sell so that you are not just randomly buying and selling based on your emotion or, or, or based on what you hear from your friend. Even if the stock price is actually very high, you also buy or you just sell during a, a market crash, even though the price is actually very low right? and you're holding on to a good stock. So this for this workshop, it'll be held on 18 February. Same thing is a face-to-face -face workshop, right? It is held at CityGate. So for those of you who are keen to learn more, you can scan this QR code or go to this link over here, right? Okay, so I took about an hour, nearly an hour, okay? Uh, and that's the end of what I have prepared for you guys for tonight's market update sharing on the three markets for US, um, China, as well as uh, for the single... Singapore reads itself, right? So if you find our short Zoom sharing session useful, do join us on our future sessions as well. Uh, and be sure to subscribe to our Telegram channel because we will actually blast out on uh, all of these workshops as well as our online Zoom sharing session on the Telegram channel itself so that you can be notified of the future sessions, right? Uh, so if you guys have any questions, I'm still here, right? If not, thank you guys for joining us tonight.